Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's guest is one of the most popular guests we have here on Chef AJ Live. We're so happy he is coming back. He actually did a, another presentation this month. He filled in for somebody who canceled at like two in the morning, and we're so grateful to that. Now, know that when we have a doctor in general, but this particular doctor in particular, you really must get your questions in in advance. We can't take them from the chat, unfortunately. And we have 18 that have already been submitted. We'll get through as many as we can. Please welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. I love great. when you come on the show, Dr. Lyle. Oh, you're a joy, AJ. It's great to see you. It's just, it's like you really, and I feel like there's no problem you can't solve. Well, we give, we give it our best shot. You know, there's a song, Nobody Solves a Problem Like Maria. And, and I think about that. You should have been your name instead. <laughs> All right. Yep. Well, yep. let's see what we got today, AJ. Let's yep. see how we do. Okay. Um, you know, you have almost 300 episodes of the Beat Your Jeans podcast now, and I have listened to all of them at least once. And I don't think you've ever discussed this, uh, this question. I think it's really interesting. It's from, it's from one of the older viewers. Well, not older. She's in her 70s. Not that old to us anymore. But her name is Betty. And she says, hi, Dr. Lyle. When I grew up, I recall that neither of my grandmothers and several of my older aunts had never learned how to drive. I remember as a young child going to my Uncle Lou's funeral and hearing people say, if only Aunt Sheila had learned to drive. Apparently, there was a medical emergency and she wasn't able to get him to the hospital. When I asked my mother about this, she said it just wasn't fashionable in the early 50s for most women to learn to drive. My Aunt Sheila tried to learn how to drive after my uncle's death, but she got so frazzled and frustrated she gave up and for the rest of her life was dependent on other people as there was no Lyft or Uber or grocery deliveries in the early 50s. I'm telling you all of this because I'm curious if in today's day and age, you feel that driving is still an essential life skill that everyone should learn, if only for in case of emergency, and if you believe that it is truly harder to learn this skill the longer you wait to learn it. So many of my great nieces and nephews and many of their peers are still living at home in their 20s and 30s and still have never learned to drive. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Thank you. Um, that's weird that she's got nieces and nephews living at home in their 20s and 30s that don't know how to drive. That's bizarre. I have lots of friends my age. This is a thing, Dr. Lyle. I can, I can tell you the names of people that their kids, their kids are not learning to drive today. Not a lot of them. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, is that what will cause, uh, I, I would bet that most of them, that almost all of them are uh, female uh, because if you're a guy, you must learn how to drive if you're going to go out on a date. Okay. The, uh, unless you happen to live in New York City, or if, you, if you're literally living in an urban center and you, you just meet people you know, down at the local bar or the local restaurant and you meet them off of a dating app, then you might not have to know how to drive. But the, through, throughout most of the United States, obviously the reason that children, uh, teenagers are so eager to learn how to drive is so, so that they can go out on a date and hopefully, you know, make out somewhere you know, on a, in, a dark, in a dark parking lot somewhere overlooking the river. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point. Okay. That's, that is a, that is the entire reason uh, why it is that that young men are so eager to get their driver's license. There were, it's 95% of the reason. So the uh, anyway, so if you, if you don't drive uh, it's now less and less essential. I mean, less and less important. In other words, you can now order things. You now, you know, if you need, if you're, if you're in a medical emergency, you call 911, you don't drive yourself to some hospital. Uh, you might not be able to drive yourself to the hospital. And the uh, so I don't consider it to be, um, I, I consider it to be obviously an option. It's, it's a fascinating. We'd have to look at it, how many statistical likelihood it is of a 30 year old not, not having a driver's license. But I have to tell you, AJ, I'll bet it's less than 3%. So if, uh, if, if this, uh, if Betty's seeing this in, in her little family tree, there's there's a set of unusual circumstances, uh, physically and personality wise, that are giving rise to this. If she's got three or four relatives like this, that's an unusual thing. And and essentially, uh, it's probably the girls. The girls, you know, and the girls could just have the guy come and pick them up, or they meet them down somewhere if they're dating, or 
or maybe they're they're the they're you know the the kind of folks that are so introverted that they're not doing much of that. So yeah, that's a uh, but in terms of our need to do that, you don't have to. There's a lot of things you know, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is breathe and eat. Okay, so that's uh, uh, it's uh, and, and a lot of people you know driving depends upon who you are and where you live. You know, it could be super uncomfortable and unpleasant. And, you know, if I grew up in San Francisco, I don't know, it, it would be very unpleasant to learn how to drive in San Francisco. And uh, in the old days, they also didn't have automatic transmissions. Uh, so to you, if anybody's anybody knows this about learning how to drive a stick shift, it's very, it's tricky. And if you were to learn to drive a stick shift then you needed to drive a stick shift in a town that was built up and down on hills. I mean, that's a terrifying prospect. Um, and so the, the thing is, is that, you know, I understand fully why people have not, uh, uh, historically, a lot of times have not learned to drive. The, uh, I think it's a, it's a great thing to, to have, but it also brings on a bunch of expense, you know? So I remember running into some 18 or 19 year old kid at some point that didn't know how to drive, and I, I remember cross-examining him like, I, you've got to be kidding. I, you know, you, aren't, aren't you anxious to take a girl out? And he had, now he had it worked out how you just met people down at the local arcade or whatever the heck that he did. And he's like, nah, driving's a trap. You know, that's just going to be a big money, money sink. So I thought, <laughs> what a cold blooded kid. Most of us had, had you know, Work, work, work nights in order to to get the money so that, so that we could drive the car around. But not that kid. He 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 had he had a coolness to him, and so he didn't drive, which was amazing. So no, it's a choice, and it's a cost benefit analysis, and we filter it through all, all of our each uh, individual circumstances. That kid I remember was a was quite an actor. So he would he he would simply be dating the girls that he was in the little theater plays with and you know he didn't he didn't need to drive what the heck but do you do you agree that if the, the longer a person waits the i remember I, ha, I did have an aunt named rufi who tried to learn to drive in her 60s and she just gave up it was so hard no it's not it's not harder when you're older it's just that it's the same personality that was frustrated all the way along it is still the same personality later so you know ha hang in there because pretty soon you're just going to hop in the car and tell it where to go uh, it's, we're not far from that. You know, you, you and I will see that, AJ. Wow. So, uh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. I'll yeah, tell there you. you go. The, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's tricky, you know, what, what a human being does. And they're, they're, they've got a lot of self-driving vehicles now, but, you know, they're, they're working out the kinks. And in the next decade, they will. And which will be a, a fantastic thing for all kinds of people, uh, but most specifically for elderly people. You know, it will be uh, because a lot of elderly people that love to drive and love the independence of it, you know, can't drive. They're 82. Their eyesight isn't good. Their reflexes aren't as good. They can still walk around and get to the car. And they would love to be able to go and go places. And, and they really it's cumbersome. So mm -hmm. that's coming. Well, you know, that there was an old joke when I used to work in retirement homes that the definition of a 10 was a five who could drive. <laughs> That is really great. I love that. But, but you're right, Dr. Lyle, because I'm so old. I remember learning to drive a stick, and that is that is much more difficult, in my opinion. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember. I remember being learning. A, I, I learned in a little thing called the Chevy Vega, um, and the, the my dad bought. He had a stick, and you know my mother had to learn, and uh, that was that that was she she's very easygoing. But then I had to learn in there. And I, I can remember being stuck on a little hill and stalling that thing out four or five times in a row. And the guy behind me is like honking. And then he comes up and he goes, is there a problem? And I'm like, so upset. I'm like this car and my mom's sitting next to me. And she goes, he's learning to drive. <laughs> so that was, that's, that's my memory of, of learning how to drive a stick. That's funny. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so here we have um, 
Mandy wants to know if you have any advice for a Felix Unger married to an Oscar Madison. She says, I've been married to my husband for almost 30 years. He's a wonderful man and we're compatible in every way, except for the fact that he's a mess cat and I'm a neat freak because he literally saves everything and doesn't throw anything out, even Christmas cards he received before we were married. The problem then gets worse every year. Could you please give me some marital advice on how we can coexist as this is literally the only thing we fight about? Is messiness a function of the big five personality? Because he actually is very conscientious and emotionally stable. So I don't understand how he can live like this. Thank you. Yeah, the the conscientiousness is it's bothering him to throw anything away. Okay. So that that's how that is manifesting in that personality. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what I would do about that. I mean, that's a hard situation. You've got a very incompatible uh, personality uh, situation there. There there might be a way uh, to. Uh, everybody's situation is different, but there might be, um, you know, everybody's finances are different. You know, finances have an impact on, on, a, on a situation like this. The, uh, it could be that if you take, uh, you know, rent a storage unit that has you know, 10 by 10 storage unit, that if you, uh, if you take some of the stuff out uh, there and put it in boxes, and so now he knows that it's where it is, and it's all labeled there, and you're willing to put up with the $125 a month, you know, fee or whatever it is, or if there's some other way to do it permanently and cheaper somehow, you know, you, you've got an acre and you can, you can go down to Home Depot and get a $2,800 storage uh, little house and they can put it on your property. There, uh, the, the idea is, is that if, if it's the pack rat uh, stuff is part of it, then we can potentially offload you know, cubic yards of this stuff somewhere else where it lightens the load on the house until the next seven years, you gather another, you, you know, it just absorbs more crap and that's okay. And then we get another storage unit and we do it that way. And it's like, okay, so we live out our lives and part of the price of, of living this life with this person is that we're going to burn $30,000 on storage fees. Oh, well, I mean, that might be, that might be very, very reasonable and possible and a, a way to make your life a lot better. Okay. So uh, that's, it's kind of like it, if, if nobody wants to mop the floors and clean the toilets and clean out the refrigerator, then you hire it done to somebody else. And that way both neither partner has to do it. A third party does it. And, and we are, a we have a little bit less money for other things, but if we can afford that, then that is a really good strategy for getting rid of, those kinds of conflicts. The um, so yeah, it depends on you know it just depends on how how bad this is. I mean certainly the uh, other things we can delineate zones of the house. That's their room. This is your room. Uh, and so you know the you know, any crap that comes in here is I'm gonna feel free to take it in and put it on your desk along with the other seventeen hundred items that are on your desk. So the um, anyway, that's how you do things. Uh, you're not going to change him. You're not going to change yourself. All that you can possibly do is change the environmental circumstances. And so uh, look to be creative and um, and actually willing to transfer resources to the problem uh, if you've got the resources to transfer in order to you know make your life better. That's all. That's all you can do. You know, it's interesting because I would not have predicted that uh, conscientiousness was th that that would be conscientiousness. I was thinking it's the opposite. No, no, there's a lot of conscientious people that are that are uh, hoarders and it, it bothers them greatly because those are resources and or they have importance for some reason and they don't want to lose them or let go of them. And it feels irresponsible to throw it out. So that that is a. Uh, you know, fortunately, I don't have that, uh, but but I know conscientious people that are that way, and they save hangers. You know what I mean? They save uh, paper bags, and they, you know, they they, they can't stop themselves, and it, and it feels very disturbing to them to you know go into their pack rat garage and try to 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 get rid of stuff. So yeah, that that's that's how that can manifest. 
But, you know, I think about when you talk about people that are in an unclean environment with food, one of the answers is you separate the food and you're kind of saying the same thing. You separate the messiness from the neatness. Yes, as much. Exactly. You 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 arrange that environment as best you can. Uh, And yeah, if you're a neat person, there's a, you know, your own neat area. you, You feel the internal calm that's like a sanctuary, you know, and there are chaos can bother you, you know it's there, but if there's a shut door between you and it, then it doesn't have to bother you nearly as badly. Yeah, yeah. I would think though that even if they were hoarders, they'd want to organize it nicely, but- who Yeah, not necessarily. They, they can be overwhelmed with it, you know? Yeah. They just know it's there. You know, they know they got to take care of it. They, they, they've got some sorting and organizing and uh, analysis to do, but yeah, they got too much to do. Yeah, that's- yeah. Uh, Yep. Just kind they have of whole te- television. Through. They have whole television shows now uh, dedicated to these types. Yes. Of yeah. 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 Thank you. All right. Okay. Andrea says, I thought of another question for Dr. Lyle. I don't know why she's setting another. Maybe she sent in two. In one of his previous interviews with you, Dr. Lyle mentioned that after learning that animals that are systematically underfed live longer, he tries leaving a few bites of food on his plate. Wouldn't this just result in the person eating more food during the next meal? Or wouldn't this cause the person to get hungry faster? Don't our natural hunger drives when eating only whole natural unprocessed food lead us to eating the correct amount? Thank you so much for clarifying, Andrea. No, she's right. The, um, uh, that, that, is, that is correct. The, yeah, it's interesting. I probably was thinking about that you know, when I learned about systematic underfeeding. I learned about that you know, 25 years ago. And so uh, at that time, I didn't have all of the logic uh, that I now now understand. And so as a result, you know, I was just sort of thinking along those lines. And I, I could actually be uh, even mistaken. And uh, I don't think I am. I think the reason for my motivation of leaving, uh, you know, sort of have leaving a little bit there is kind of that concept. It's just sort of running around the back of my head. It's the notion that, um, that, that you have, uh, you have, you, you could probably, probably the following is true. The, um, for somebody like myself, I can eat more calories, but the way my biology is built is that I will, um, I will not store them. Okay, very effectively. So the point is, is that my guess is if I were to eat 2,200 calories a day instead of 2,100 calories a day, I don't actually believe that I would be any difference in weight. So um, this isn't fantasy. I mean, experiments have been done on this. So uh, people that are built like me have been incentivized to try to gain weight by eating very high density calories and they cannot gain any weight. So uh, I believe that biologically, it wouldn't make really much difference what the hell I ate. I think I'd be sitting at about the kind of body morphology that I have now. I'd be a hell of a lot less healthy. Uh, but, but if I ate McDonald's three meals a day, I think I, I unlike the supersized guy, he was more of a mesomorph. Um, I'm ectomorphic. And so uh, I believe that I might gain a pound or two. And that's all that you would ever see. Okay. Uh, and it would be the, the difference between me eating a really healthy diet and a trash diet would be internal. It would be in the arteries. It would be in stoking, you know, uh, free radical formation and, and potentially generating cancer, but it wouldn't be putting fat on. Okay. So, um, so I know this. So I, I, I'm quite aware that this is just the, the nature of my, my biology. So I also believe, and perhaps wrongly, but maybe not, uh, eh, it's probably mostly wrong, but not entirely wrong. And that is that I'm probably better off than eating 2,100 calories a day rather than 22. A little bit. In other words, I, I put a little extra drag on the system. Uh, in other words, there's another 100 calories of, to be detoxified. Uh, and it's not anything I need. Uh, So my, so sort of consciously what I'm trying to do is I'm knowing full well that, uh, that I, I could, I could put in, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna actually 
if I'm going to over, if I'm going to quote overeat and I'm going to eat 2,200 calories, it'll be because I ate spaghetti. It won't be because I ate potatoes and beans. It will be some processed food that will enable me to systematically put another 100 calories in there comfortably. So when I would, you know, I, the, this little kind of semi-conscious idea of just go ahead and leave that last tiny little bit of food, that's rattling around my skull, not when I've got a big salad or a bunch of steamed vegetables in front of me, but it's when there has been some processed food that I've been eating. And then my attitude is, you know, Doug, you are probably, um, uh, you, you are probably systematically overeating today if you are eating any substantial amount of processed food. And so therefore, just don't eat, don't, don't, don't cram in and get to, full, you know, satiety isn't a specific moment. It's a range of processes that is changing second by second inside your nervous system. So it's a, it's a vague target. And so, you know, there's always, you could always have one more grape or one more raisin for goodness sakes. You know, at some point you will finally recognize that you feel sick because you, you know, but you could still probably put more, one more in the, um, so yeah, I, I somewhere uh, be, as a result of me reading the research on the systematic underfeeding of animals and the substantial life extension, which I now understand uh, why that happened and we can't mimic it in humans. The, um, uh, but the, as a result of that, just the, the general idea of reducing toxic load, possibly slowing metabolic processes, et cetera, yeah, that, that became kind of a, a little tiny habit out of the set side of my head. Um, it's still there a little bit. Uh, I, I think I'm aware that if I've been eating something that's processed and therefore the concentration of the calories is relatively high, um, then, my, then my reaction is go ahead, you know, don't go ahead and necessarily uh, eat to the upper end of your satiety distribution eat to the lower end of your satiety distribution. I, I actually don't feel that way when I'm eating whole natural food. Curious. Yeah, so you, you've spotted a, a curiosity. God knows my, my little internal machinations about how I run this thing are, are idiosyncratic to me. Uh, so very probably very few people are, are thinking that's interesting. Alan has a different... Uh, Alan has a different mentality and it is actually secondary to our personalities. I learned about this. We learned about this uh, when we did that seminar with you, AJ, in 2016 at the Mermaid. This is where this, this conversation came up in a Q&A. And I remember looking over at Alan and he looked at me and listened to me. And he thought, that's interesting. That's not what I'm thinking. And what Alan does is Alan goes and gets a tiny little bit more food and then eats that. And he's got a little waste issue in his head because he's cheap. <laughs> okay. So he's going to take a little bit and then eat that and then take a little bit more and eat that. He'll go back four times for two bites each time. And then he'll be monitoring his satiety that way. I don't do it that way. I'll get plenty and then I'll eat. And then I'll think to myself, if I kind of had enough, do I feel fine? And if I've reached a modest intermediate level of satiety and the food is on the rich, richest side, then I'll tell myself, that's it, throw it out. And so in, in my head, I'm always thinking about, uh, probably because I've eaten more naughty food than Allen House in the last 40 years, I'm thinking about, you know, Doug, you're better off without that. You know, what are you gonna save the money and continue to eat that thing, whatever it is? No, just throw it out, you're better off without it. And so that little, uh, you know, tiny little idiosyncratic differences between people. And that resulted in me, this playing out that way in me. I don't consciously think about that much anymore. Um, uh, I think that the habit is still there a little bit because I actually feel better digestive wise. Um, if I go ahead and, and uh, don't allow myself to indulge to the high side of satiety on something like spaghetti. Okay. So the, um, i it's not that I don't do that. It's just that I, I will consciously try to steer myself away from it. And eight times out of 10, I will, I will, I'll able to steer myself away. The, um, 
Let's see. I can't, can't. I lost my train of thought. That's enough on this anyway. Well, it's funny because I did see you overindulge once in Texas at Dr. Baxter Montgomery's house, but the food was unusually rich. It was. It was. And I was a little bit bummed about it because there was, uh, I, that was a rare spread, as you remember, AJ. It was, and, but there was enough food there to feed an army. And uh, we looked at that. I looked at all that stuff and and, you know, I just didn't have enough space to eat everything that I wanted to eat. So, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah it was right. particularly it was a lot of raw food. So it was particularly high in fat. Oh, that the desserts were a lot of happened. remember because it was, it was Chef Babette who had a restaurant in L.A. or still does. So a yes. lot of rich like date nut type cacao desserts and things stuff like that, that I'm not used to. And I yeah. And I by the time I'd eaten a bowl full, I was feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. There you go. Yep. All right. Great. Thanks. Next got? question is from Matthew. And he says, Dr. Lyle, I am a highly conscientious, but also highly open person. I find myself easily able to create and keep orderly habits, but they eventually make me physically sick with boredom. Breaking the habit makes me very uncomfortable too. And sometimes I can wind up feeling paralyzed. Am I certifiable? How do I scratch both itches? No, I think you're going to you're going to continue to oscillate and experiment until we find a really good equilibrium and you haven't found it yet. OK, so this is the equivalent of all of us can relate to uh, this in some fashion. So let me I'll, I'll give you an example of two people and the differences in their openness on this dimension. The um, uh, Alan and I. So Alan is about the second percentile for openness. I'm probably 50th percentile. So I'm pretty normal. The uh, uh, and Alan is abnormal. So when it came to try to figure out where we're going to live our lives, I've lived all over the place. I've lived in Idaho. I've lived in Maryland. I've lived in Virginia. I've lived in Texas. I've lived in San Diego. You know, um, I've lived in the Bay Area. Now I'm at, out in the Sacramento Valley. Okay, so. I bounced all over the place. I, I considered everything, like it was all on the table. I, I knew I didn't want to live in Alaska. Uh, after living in Idaho, I knew I didn't want to live in the North. Uh, Virginia was North enough and it's too cold for me. So in other words, I found myself in Texas. It's like, oh no, that's too far South. That's too hot. <laughs> so I could remember the, the law the long summers in Texas. And, and so, uh, there's places that uh, the uh, I like it drier, but there's times when I've gotten off a plane in Florida and it's like, man, I kind of like some of that humidity. But then if it gets too hot, then it's too much. It's like, you know, it's like Princess in the Pea looking, looking, looking. And um, eventually I found I found the, the, a place that feels really good for for, for who, who it is that my, my physiology. Interestingly, Alan doesn't like he likes it cooler. So Alan likes it cooler. A Alan, if he could, he would, he would literally, uh, I think Alan's ideal temperature is probably about 64 degrees. So if you go into his office, you know, it's cold. And then you go into the treatment room, it's a little warmer, but, but you know, he didn't like to work in that treatment room at 68 degrees. He, he would, he would prefer it about 64 degrees that he's full of hot air. So I always tell him <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, individual differences in people. Alan hasn't hardly get, been anywhere. He he like he you know he drove through, saw Santa Rosa, Bay Area. That's it. He's done. You know he looked on the, he looked on the little chart, saw how much rain it got, how much sunshine. He's like done. That's it. That's the differences in openness. So this person is bouncing around, you know, between one one thing and the next, and you you will eventually find yourself an equilibrium that will, will work for for you, but you're still experimenting. And, uh, you know, there's some people that if you get out there to 80th or 90th percentile uh, for openness, they're, they're searching their whole lives for where they want to live. Yeah, so they, they, they never, they're, they're a rolling stone. So uh, so anyway, that that's what's going on there. So good luck to you. That's your personality. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Keith wanted to know what you thought about the new weight loss drug semi-glutide, because what's happening is people that are taking it in addition to losing weight, it's reducing their urge to drink. Apparently it affects the brain's reward circuits, decreasing addictive behaviors as well as hunger. And now some doctors are actually saying they're successfully using it to treat patients with alcohol use disorder. Yeah, this is another, uh, if I, if I was a, a very bright young attorney, I would be rubbing my hands, be like, oh man, you know, there, there's a, there's a big class action suit over here, over the horizon here somewhere. You know, I, I need to position myself for a law firm that's likely to go for this. So, you know, it, the, I looked into, into this research. I think that the, the average weight loss that the people that they, uh, that they demonstrated the effect on um, just to, I think the average, it was mostly women. And so the average weight, uh, the, the average woman in that study, I think was solidly over 200 pounds, I believe. We'd have to look at the data. And um, I think the average person was 220 pounds and they wound up losing about 33 pounds. Uh, in the placebo condition, they lost about five or six pounds because there's a little bit of lifestyle stuff that was also encouraged in the people. So the, this drug resulted in over a year, it resulted in people losing 27 pounds. Um, okay, it's interesting. So, so you look at that thing and you realize, okay, so I'm 225 pounds and I'm five foot four. And now a year later, and if I'm, if I'm one of the people that dodge the severe gastrointestinal problems that are caused in, in a, you know, a significant percentage of the people that use the stuff, um, that, okay, now I'm down at 195. It's like, oh, that, that, that's some grand celebration. And you know, like, we, we've got other things that, that can do that. So I don't think that this is, this is no wonder drug. People that are uh, claiming that this has helped their alcohol, it's not surprising you have something that, um, something that's that impactful on the human brain, we would expect some unusual side effects that would take place. Um, I doubt like hell that this is gonna be a useful alcohol treatment drug. The, uh, the your, your, remember people, uh, uh, somebody, uh, I learned about that about 20 years ago, a study had been done that about 50% of anything you saw in the press had been placed there very, very carefully. So uh, I think I was reading a book on a book called uh, The End of Marketing as We Know It by the guy who had been the CEO of uh, the head of marketing for PepsiCo and Coca-Cola, by the way, like two different times in his career. I think it's the same guy. And, um, and yeah, I think that's where I read that, where he said 50% of every newsprint that you see. So you see a story in, you know, in the desert review in, in, in Las Vegas and wherever it is. And it's like, oh, you see a little thing there. You see a little story, a little, little you know, thousand word story on Mrs. So-and-so in her, in her, you know, is, is learning, is baking cookies in her old age. And she never before used brown sugar. And then now she is, and then her grandkids love it. It's like, oh, you know, it looks like a cool little story they put in there for the Sunday section. No, they didn't. That was, that was written and paid for by industry. So that was 20 years ago. Now it's probably 95%. Now they don't leave anything to chance. So when you're looking at a story of some guy who says, oh boy, my alcohol cravings went down, you're not looking at a story. You're, you're looking at a carefully selected script, basically triangulated on you know, oh, oh, no, he's an authentic guy right out of, you know, Minnesota. And he's just telling the story. He's telling it on the Internet. Yeah, careful. Don't 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 be a fool. You, you are some new drug is being used widely for weight loss. And now they're going to start touting it as if it's health food. It's like it's good for you. It's like, wow, it's doing a lot of good stuff. And the fact that doctors are now starting to treat that, of course, they are. That's what doctors do is they think that the magic bullet that comes from the pharmaceutical industry is some really good thing and that they want to help their patients. It's a well-meaning doc. So doctors are people who believe in those kind of interventions. If you look at the sum total 
of what goes on in medical intervention, it's horrendous. They do incredible damage constantly, but they don't, they don't even look sideways. So they, they, they believe in it. Ask the cerebrovascular surgeons in the 20th century who were so proud of themselves that they could go in and, you know, when you found, you know, potential aneurysms in people's brains, hey, we can cut their skulls off and go in there and then clip the two arteries under major surgery and then, you know, cinch them back together and get rid of that aneurysm part. By God, we can, we can save lives. We can look at what we can do. We're brilliant neurosurgeons. Yep. You were killing twice as many people as you were saving. Okay. They didn't do any science on that. They did, they went later on afterwards, people went back and did archival research and saw that the rate of death of people that had got, had gotten cerebrovascular surgery was twice what it was for people who had, you know, didn't, didn't do that surgery. Oh, that stopped that practice. Okay. Now it turns out that bypass surgery, which became the big, you know, can, can, became and is this massive money-making thing for the hospital systems. It turns out that you can look at the same evidence there. Almost none of it, it does anything, all, almost, you know, the left anterior descending bypass, there's some increased likelihood of statistical likelihood of survival. None of it's even close to just getting the person to eat some kale now and then. The, um, anyway, the point is, is that careful. Here's another gimmick, okay? And whenever I, you know, when I saw the results, it's like, ooh, you know, had they said 10 pounds, I would have said, rolled my eyes and said, okay, well, 10 pounds, you got to be kidding me. Okay, well, you take very obese people and they lose, you know, 27 pounds that they wouldn't have lost. Well, I know what that means. That means that you had a substantial impact on, on the brain or the metabolism. In other words, it, it, to, to get that to happen, you had to really mess up some important genetically built up natural systems. Okay, you, you're, that's bad. That's very invasive. Okay, so now it's like, okay, it's like the difference between the damage that's been done by antidepressants and the damage that's done by antipsychotics. Antipsychotics are much more, you know, they're much more aggressive. Somebody tells me, oh, I've been on, you know, SSRIs for three years. I'm like, don't sweat it. You know, move your way off. You know, let's get some slowly get, get down from it. You're going to be fine. You've been on antipsychotics for three years. Oh man. Okay. You know, your, our job is to, to move in a healthy direction, but I'm thinking to myself, you may never be the same. Okay. So the, um, it's like, okay, so something may be permanently lost as a result of having been on antipsychotics, they're tougher. So whenever anything has a big effect, I'm always thinking, uh-oh, big side effects. Drugs don't have effects. I mean, drugs, do, it, it, the side effect isn't so, oh, it's got this little side effect. No, drugs have effects. And some of them you like, some of them are, are what something you wanna see happen. And some of them are things you don't wanna see happen. But the idea that you could slither your way through and get what you want and not get what you don't want, uh uh, it's a package deal. So, this thing that, that causes, you know, 27 pounds of weight loss, um, it's, it's likely to have some pretty nasty effects that we will see in the next 10 years. God knows what they'll be. Uh, and it won't be easy getting to that data. And the reason is nobody's looking for it. No, nobody's interested in looking for it. So the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is um, ruthless. And so even if they know that there is significant damage being done in a modest percentage of people by use of this drug, they will game it out with actuaries and they'll realize, okay, what's our odds of getting sued? How big would the class action be? How much are we gonna have to pay? How much money are we gonna make on it, okay? I kid you not, this is exactly how it's done. So it is, okay, well, we're likely to make $16 billion over the next 10 years. If we pay out a billion five in a class action suit, it's not a problem, it's the cost of doing business, okay? Meanwhile, over at True North Health Center, Alan has shown that with a water fast and a healthy diet, 
you can have effectively the same effect. Okay, all good. And uh, it's like, oh, no damage at all. You're healthier. All of your, all, everything about you gets healthier. So of course, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna take that on. And there's no money in it. We don't, we don't put it in a drug and patent it and sell it and make a fortune. Uh, so anyway, what, what's the, what's the truth here? Not interested. I'm not interested in anything that has a significant alteration of a metabolic system that, that's that major trouble. You should look at that and say, wow, what else is it doing? Okay, so what, what, is, what else is it doing that I can't see? So now, is it possible that someday, you know, I mean, there, there are drugs that are useful for very specific things. And when we look at the cost benefit profile of it, if you if it happens to be you and the circumstances are what they are, that the drug is, uh, you know, could be life saving in a very rare number of cases, but it could be helpful and make your life better in other cases. You know, most of the time, that's not true. So most of the time, what is true is that uh, the person needs to live healthier, get rid of the underlying problem and not use the drug. That is what people should be doing in almost every case, not in every case, okay? There are cer certainly exceptions, that's what medicine's for. Uh, there are time and places for, uh, that's why chapter, uh, I think the second chapter or third chapter of the pleasure trap is called the miracle and madness of modern medicine, okay? Mod modern medicine can be miraculous but it is more likely to be madness. And uh, this, this folks is madness. That's, I, I smell trouble. <laughs> For God's sakes, if you're 225 pounds, your job isn't to get to 100 and 195 by drugging yourself. Your job is to get to 140 by eating properly. That is how that should work. Okay. All right. That's what I you know, about it. Um, you know, what's interesting, Dr. Lyle, is when I was reading that article that I sent you about it, is they weren't using it at first for alcohol, but the people that were taking it were saying that they were no longer getting a buzz from the alcohol. And then when they weren't getting the buzz, they didn't want to drink the alcohol. Careful. Industry. You, you got to understand that storytelling. That, that, is a, that, that may be true in 1% of those people. But industry hit on that and says, okay, now we're going to get, we, we got the family members, you know, we got 5% of this country. You got, you got 20 million alcoholics in this country, 17 million of them desperate. And right next to them are another 35 million people that love them. So you got 50,000 people or 50 million people that are highly motivated to try to figure out a problem for alcoholism. Gee, do you think we might be able to sell 50 million people on this new drug? Oh yeah, that story isn't an organic story that gee, it just seems to be working. Yeah, that's BS, okay? That is not what you're seeing. That is a firestorm of profit-seeking, mar brilliant mar marketing that takes place. That didn't happen by accident. That's not, the way it happened in the Stone Age village where somebody figures out two sticks to rub together and finds out that if you get the red stick with the blue stick, you know, it turns out our fire goes better. And you're like, hey, look at this. Oh, and then it organically spreads through the local culture because it's really cool. No, that's not what this is. This is engineered, sinister, very clever marketing. Don't think that it's not. This is no solution for alcoholism. Uh, I, I would be very surprised if we had a random assignment condition process on alcoholics uh, and we have this, that we would see any significant impact at all. It might be, might be some tiny little impact, but, but, and believe me, if it does have that impact, oh, it stops the reward centers. Oh, it stops the reward centers. So therefore when I have sex, I don't feel anything either. Like just where is it going to end? Oh yeah. When I eat a nice crisp apple that I used to like, nah, it doesn't feel like anything. Don't want to eat it. Oh, yeah. What do you mean you impact the reward centers? It's such an easy story to tell. You know, I smell a big, fat pharmaceutical rat in the whole thing. 
All right, that's where thank, we are. Thank you. This is from Concerned Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't say I couldn't use her name, so it's Melissa. She says, I've learned so much from all your guests and my favorite is Dr. Lyle. One of my four adult children is always mishandling money, losing his phones. He has an unhealthy lifestyle. One of his issues is the ego trap. Another is the pleasure trap, pain, unrest. He's 30, He's 33. How do I help him or not help him? Yeah, um, I think you you don't bother to try to help him. I think that he, you know, 33 years old, this is a, this is what I call a fully, a fully baked loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is this is who this person is. So just like any friend, loved one, you know, uh, child, in other words, we're going to help them if they're in trouble. So if they come to us and, you know, through their irresponsibility and incompetence and bad luck, when they get into trouble, of course, we're going to help people we love when they're in hot water. Uh, to varying degrees, depending upon how repetitive the problem is, et cetera, et cetera. So if I have a kid that's crashed three cars, you know, I'm done insuring his cars. Okay, so uh, that's the end of it. It's like, okay, well, it sounds like to me, like, you know, I, I think that uh, the first car, I would, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too upset. I'd be like, well, I hope you're safe. The second time, I'd be like, what the hell? How'd you wind up? Uh, I think we're done. I'm done insuring your cars for you. You're going to now have to pay for your own insurance. Okay. So, uh, so in other words, sooner or later, we, you know, we're going to, we're going to sort of carve out where we think that the uh, what's fair and what's reasonable relative to family resources and what we're going to do. But the sound of this and the right, the right perspective to take on this is that you're watching his personality. Okay. So this is who this person is. It doesn't make him a bad person. It just mean, means that they're a person that's susceptible to the, the latitude in the modern environment that enables uh, uh, him to be, you know, sort of mediocre in terms of his general effectiveness uh, and, and his conscientiousness. If he were placed in the middle of the wild in a stone age troop, he would be incredibly responsible. He would still have the same personality, but he would not have the latitude that he has. And he'd have to be an awful lot more focused and he'd be a lot hungrier, he'd be better shape. There'd be no pleasure trap at all in the environment. And the, um, the ego trap wouldn't be there because he'd get forced into performing at the level of his ability. Uh, so any ego traps would be incredibly short-lived. In other words, the the we are going to watch limitations of this personality in being able to manage the opportunities and, and threats of the modern environment and not be able to manage it particularly well. And he's going to sort of, you know, he's going to have this sort of meandering process. You never know that the, the, the innate desire of the, the human is to become more effective and more competitive. He may grow up in some important ways, even from here. Uh, he may have some changes in his life, uh, grab, a, you know, grab a hold of an idea or a philosophical, uh, some philosophical leadership, which in, it pulls him out and through the pleasure trap. I mean, the ego trap or whatever it is. We may see him shift and become significantly more effective at 38 than he is at 33. We don't know. OK, but at 33, um, it's still a fully baked loaf of bread. You're actually looking at what you're looking at. You aren't necessarily looking at the end game of where it goes. Like if we look back in AJ's history, you know, AJ, AJ was, uh, did fascinating things uh, at a young age. In other words, you were, you know, but you've done all kinds of different things. We watch all a, we just a real odyssey. You know, that worked, that didn't work very well. Had to do that for a while. Boom, 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 boom. But we saw a, a determination to try to do something interesting, uh, even early in your twenties, you know, you were doing the Johnny Carson show for God's sakes, who on earth gets on the Johnny Carson? Nobody gets on the Johnny Carson show. Okay. So that's how uh, you also went on game shows. I understand. Oh, lots of them. They were fun. I won a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, most of us would be terrified to go on those things. So your, your sense of an adventure, your comfort with being, 
you know, uh, you know, on camera, all that kind of stuff. This, these are not, these are not sort of common characteristics. And so it bubbles and it bubbles, and this is where we wind up. So the, um, but anyway, the bottom line is this young man is on his own odyssey. We don't kind of know where it's going, but as a parent, our job is not to try to steer him and particularly educate him or cajole him or anything else. Our job is to not inconvenience our own life, uh, uh, particularly with, with his issues. If he's in trouble, that's different. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like you got a kid that's struggling with alcohol um, and he gets into trouble and he's at a DUI and, you know, it's been kind of a mess and he's, he holds down his job. Okay. It's not my job to be monitoring him or cajoling him into trying to get clean. Okay. Now, uh, his life is what it is. Now, he gets into trouble and he comes to me or I see, uh oh, no, no, now you're in serious trouble. Okay, that's different. Okay, I'm not, now it's like, now I'm in, now I'm in up, up to my elbows to try to figure out how to help you and get you into rehab. And, you know, I'm not sure what, what now you've got legal trouble because of some, something that you did when you were under the influence. It's like, okay, we got a crisis. So now we're, we're all in because we're family. Fine. That's different. Day-to-day -day management of a personality that is struggling in mediocrity in this environment, this is not, this is not a crisis. Uh, they do their thing. You do your thing. They need help. We consider it whether or not it's an appropriate, repetitive problem, predictable problem that they should just suffer the consequences. Uh, i.e. the kid after the second car isn't getting his car insured by me. He's going to have to pay the astronomical fees, uh, et, et cetera. That's how that's going to go down. I'm out. Okay. So th these are the ways we, you know, we, we don't have to be tough and nasty about it, but through the thread here is the thread of reasonable responsibility. And so we, you know, that, that's how I would look at it. I would not inconvenience my life particularly over a 33-year-old who is managing their life in a sort of mediocre fashion. It's like, hey, love the kid, good luck, you know. Don't forget, I told you, that's a good book to read someday. Don't forget that that documentary I gave you, Forks Over Knives, it's not a bad documentary, maybe you ought to watch it someday. I wouldn't stop putting little bugs in their ear to try to encourage them to go down a you know, good direction, but I wouldn't wear myself out over it. Thanks. Good. All right. Um, let me just thank Nomad Wanderer for the super chat donation as we go to the next question from Andy. I see people around me talking about having a good relationship with food, which means they can enjoy treats in moderation. I used to think this, but after learning more from you and Dr. Lyle and Dr. McDougall, I can see how moderation doesn't work. How do I navigate these situations where my friends think it's disordered if I skip the ice cream after dessert, especially if I always used to join in on the ice cream? Well, the truth is, is that the, um, these are individual differences in this. So in the same way that, you know, I, I have never had a glass of wine in my life because I don't like it. It tastes like vinegar to me. But if I choked down a glass of wine because I don't know, the, uh, the, the Prince of Morocco, you know, had me over to his house and he said, listen, you know, this is this special wine. <laughs> I mean, I could, I can envision a certain set of circumstances where I might actually have to choke down a glass of wine. If I did, um, it would be like no big deal. Okay. It'd be like, okay, no big deal. But Jen Hawk better not do it because Dr. Jen Hawk's an alcoholic. So Jen Hawk is now, you know, tremendously recovered. She's extremely stable. It's been many, many, many years, but she knew that, you know, 10 years ago and 20 years ago, uh, when she was a young woman for, for a decade, you know, when, when she found out about alcohol, she was in trouble because that that's, and, uh, that is in her genes. So in, individual differences here are tremendous. And so Jen has, you know, uh, you know, is, is not tempted at all it doesn't even think about it. It's not on her radar. She's got it very much under control, but she knows. Okay, she knows, no, that is completely off the table, okay? For me, that's not true. I mean, 
alcohol specifically is because I just couldn't, I don't, I have no affinity for it at all. But the point is, is that somebody else, we could be looking at, I don't know, chocolate or ice cream, you know, chocolate ice cream. Okay. Well, for me, again, I'm the kind of person that, oh, you know, if you gave me some, I would never eat cow's milk chocolate ice cream. But the point is, if you gave me soy milk chocolate ice cream, I'd be like, oh, okay. Well, thank you. And it's the end of the end of your the, the meal that we had, and that's what people are doing. That wouldn't be a problem for me. For somebody else, it would be in a tremendous problem. So th they would recognize that's a problem for me. I'm going to be thinking about that chocolate ice cream pretty soon. I'm going to start buying it every night of the week. And now, you know, I've I've spent all this time to lose 80 pounds. That is dynamite for me. It's kryptonite. So that's what you're saying. There's individual differences in people. Uh, those individual differences are profound. You know, we have to respect those things. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate. To the best of my knowledge, I, I just, whatever it is, I lead a boring life with a very inactive dopamine system. And I just really am not, don't have an addictive gene in me. I have a friend of mine who is headed into surgery and he knows that he is much less stable. Okay, he knows it. And the doc is saying, hey, for the pain on this thing, you know, we're going to give you, we're going to give you some opiates because the pain is going to be uh, considerable. And we talked about it and we said, no, you're not taking those opiates. Don't even take them. Oh, the doc's like, well, just in case. And, and I, we talked it through. No, absolutely not. Okay. The, uh, we would rather have a week of hellish suffering in the pain that we can probably manage with ice, you know what I mean? And some other things like there's, there's a way to keep that pain at some sane and reasonable level. We would much rather that have that than wreck our life. Okay. Because he's well aware, you know, with his history, he's got an edginess around chemicals that, you know, he's never an opiate addict, but he. He is aware that inside that nervous system is a potential for instability, but that would be a mistake. So, and he's got cognitive dissonance even thinking about it. That's why he called him. Glad he did. Okay, so he's got enough conscientiousness and brains to pick up the phone and talk to his friend, say, well, what about this? And I'm like, well, don't do it then. Let's not look back over our shoulders and think, wow, we did that for what? Hell, you you know, the injury that you had, the Cause of the surgery is causing more pain than the surgery is going to cause. You've already lived through that. Of course, you can live through some more pain. Okay. The um, anyway. So the answer to the story is, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable. You better believe. Well, as Dr. Hawk said, you know, I don't think it was about eight years ago or so she got sober. Doesn't have a single friend left over from that from that time. All new ones. <laughs> nobody survived the cut. Isn't that amazing? It's like, no, had to get everybody that was going to be completely supportive and respectful of where it is that she was at. And anybody that gave her any pushback, any little stress, any little push, any little come on, like, no, you know, she found out, uh-uh, this is really, really hard to get out of this pleasure trap. Okay. Got out. And once she's out, she's like, man, boy, there's the, you know, the, the, the the uh the sort of army of people that are that are out there to not out for my best interest you know that were supposedly my friends look out so that doesn't mean you fire all your friends you test them okay in other words when you're when you decline no nope, no thanks not for me you know the uh what else do you have you got a little fresh fruit bowl it's like they give you any shit at all just mark it and you're going to communicate you know later on to him. Hey, listen, you know, I just really appreciate it. I'm trying to walk this walk and this is what I need to do. So, Hey, you know, the, any kind of social pressure, I, that's not good for me. Can you put that away? A little 24 second conversation. If they're your friend, they'll be, Whoa. I mean, I can imagine if anybody friend of mine had ever said anything like that about their, an alcohol problem or anything else. And it'd be like, whoa, you just, you know, or it had been junk food like that. And, and they were around me and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I kind of like those, I don't know, 
guiltless gourmet chips. You know, I kind of like those. Yeah. Okay. And, and if they told me, you know what, that's a problem. I can't have them around. Or if I come over to your house or something, I'd be like, Hey, you got my 100% support. As soon as you open your mouth about that, you know, no problem. Don't be telling me what to do in my spare time. In other words, if you're somebody that likes to drink wine now and then, you know, Jen Hawk isn't telling other people, oh, you shouldn't be drinking the wine. It's bad for them. No, that's, that's their business. That's their problem. But don't then be pushing her. That's, that's, that's not a friend. That, that's a subversive element in your life. So these people that where you're uncomfortable around, you do the right thing. And if you get any pushback, you quietly inform them about, hey, it's important that, you know, you need them on your team for what it is that you're doing because you have different circumstances that they have. Okay. That's how you do it. And if they don't eagerly and respectfully support that, they may forget at some other later point because they forget the conversation because it's not that important to them. And they may screw up again or halfway through a sentence say, oh, no, sorry, sorry. Okay. But their heart better be in completely the right place. And if it's not, off with their heads. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, they're lost my game. Dr. Jen Hawk is now one of my best friends. So I uh, ha had some other people, you know, been more respectful of what it is that she was going through and honored that achievement. Um, yeah, I never would have found her. She would have, she would have continued on in her in her life on the direction that it would have been going, it would have been fine. Nope, it took radical change, get rid of everybody, and there was room for some of us to pile in. Good, fine. Now, now life is better. Nice. You got time for one more? You I want sure to do. Okay. You got Great. Um, you know, I did want to say, I forgot to say this at the beginning of the show, Dr. Lau, but it just so happens that, it, it, that you were already scheduled. This is my 1200th episode, 1200th show. And in numerology, 1200, me, the meaning of the number 1200 is to strengthen you, to give you more direction and to help you expand. And that is exactly what you're doing <laughs> for us. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I can say one thing. Um, you know, uh, I talk to people, you know, all, all over the country and other places too. And, you know, AJ, the, um, one of the things is that our people, we will never know this, but so many of the people that listen to us, they are, are often, they have very interesting things about them. It's not just interesting lives, but some of them are, are talented and, and fascinating. And, you know, sometimes they'll shyly tell me from time to time. And so some gal that I was talking to uh, was not even anything primary. We we're working on some, some basic, basic stuff. And she, she said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a writer. I'm like, you're a writer. <laughs> What's that? I know, you know, I, I've written one book. I mean, you know how hard it is to get one single book written, AJ. So I'm like, oh, and she said, and I said, oh, really? Uh, what's, what's the deal? And she says, well, I've written my first novel. And I'm like, and I'm like, okay, well, people might write a novel, which is really hard, but almost nobody will ever get a novel published. And so, so I just said, and, and she said, yeah, it's going to be coming out next year. I'm like, whoa, to actually be a published novelist, I have to tell you, that is no small feat. That I don't care. I don't care if it's a 67 page short story. It is not easy. Anyway, this book, uh, I asked to read it and I did read it and it's just coming out now. I think it's available now. And AJ, it's actually fun. Uh, you're, I, you're, you're not a romance novel reading girl, but it's called Marrying Myself. And, and, and she, this girl, uh, this lady, girl, anybody under 50 is a girl to me, you know, the, uh, is a, uh, she's, she's a vegan and, and in her characters, and it's called Marrying Myself, it's Chrissy Benson. And the, the character is, uh, the protagonist lady is vegan. And AJ running into some of the social situations and the irritation that she gets and the sanctimonious preaching she gets from other people as a result of her vegan diet. There's all these scenes in it that, that are sort of right out of our, our lives. 
I am so glad you talked to that. You know, they asked me to have her on the show and I ah. passed because I didn't think it would be interesting to my audience. But if so, you're recommending it, oh. I'll read the book and have her on. Oh, read read the book. And I bet, I mean, it, it's obviously the, 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 the plot theme of the book is, is wider than that. It's a, it's about, it's about, you know, your own, you know, sort of as a woman, sort of not having your whole life anchored around quote, Mr. Right, but instead, you know, winding up your own personal growth and journey. So it's, it's actually, I mean, I, I, I don't even want to give it a left-handed compliment by saying, Hey, for a first novel, it's like, no, for any novel, it's, it's very good and it's funny. And, uh, I, I'm, you know, but, but specifically for a first novel, it, it's, it's impressive. So uh, I, I remember I read, I think, I've read a lot of first novels by very fine writers and they were good, but they weren't, they weren't, they didn't blow you away. You know what I mean? They, but you can tell, oh no, this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. This, this ranks with something that you'd pull off the New York Times bestseller romance novel list. It's like, now I, I wish her every bit of success and she deserves it. All right, send her my way. I'll have her on the show. I, I, it's, I, I, it's just her book's not on Audible. That's the problem. I'm actually. Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm going to have to read it with my eyes. I really want to suggest to her to please get it on Audible. It's a very yeah. easy thing it's, to do. Novels have long lives. You'll get to it when you get to it. But I just I want people to know that that was fun. That was a fun read. Okay, okay. I'm I'm going to book her if yeah. she if she wants to be on the show. Sure. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. That's yeah. so weird. When more than one person says something, you know you have to do it. All okay. Right. So well, the last one more, question. One more. Question. Yeah, one more. We we have more, but we're going to just do All one. Right. We'll save the rest for next time. This is from Natalie. So traditional therapists' approach is the bruised banana theory. They look more into nurture and not considering gene variation and personality differences, right? right? So if traditional therapy really doesn't work, why do people see those therapists and psychologists and say it helped them so much? And why do they go there for years and recommend it to others? Um, first of all, I wouldn't say that it doesn't work. I would say that it's... Um, um, mostly what most therapy winds up being is it winds up being the, the, uh, sort of the, the personality and intelligence and empathy of the therapist and not much about anything that they learn. So m most therapists are just kind of flying by the seat of their pants. They've been taught a way that they should be thinking about things. But at the end of the day, what they are is that they are, an above average IQ sensitive bartender. Okay. That's what they are. They're just coming up with, with what makes sense to them. And some of them are very good. In other words, they, they've got they they've got naturally really good social instincts and, um, and they give quite good advice, et cetera. And they can do people a lot of good and other therapists are so, so, and other therapists are lousy. Okay. But what they don't have is they don't have any really good coherent philosophy or set of therapeutic techniques that are actually directed at problem solving because they don't understand what the problems are. They're just going entirely by intuition. So the, uh, it turns out that when you study therapists, uh, even scientifically across different styles of therapy, you find out that there's nothing associated with the style of therapy that increases the success rate. It turns out that the success rate is, is associated with the specific therapist. And it's a, uh, in other words, it's the, it's, the it's the natural skill of the therapist that is responsible for the differences that you see in the two outcomes between two therapists. It's not what it is that they know. Okay. In other words, it's not their, it's not their therapeutic orientation. It's got nothing to do with it. This is amazing. Massive amounts of work has been done to try to figure this out. It's summarized every few years in the updated tome by Garfield and Bergen uh, called Psychotherapy Outcome Research. In other words, I all myself and all uh, scientific, uh, scientific oriented therapists of which there aren't many of us, but the, scientific, the, the scientists in the field that have looked at these questions uh, it, have been 
were exasperated for 40 years over the fact that, oh no, all, the, all that we ever see is what's known as non-specific effects. So everybody likes to claim their specific effects, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy. And you know, for borderline, you're like, oh, that's supposed to be this great thing. No, it's not, it's no different. It's just same non-specific effects that we see on anything. Oh no, depth therapy, that's better for this and that. No, it's not. All you're seeing is therapist effects. So why do I think that what it is that I, I do is better? Because my mind is actually built upon a revolution in the understanding of psychology itself. So no other theories of psychology, uh, of psychotherapeutic process, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, depth therapy, dynamic therapy, whatever it is, all of it is based on a lack of understanding of the nature of psychology per se, okay? So there has been a revolution in psychology. That revolution in psychology is, um, is, yeah, has threatened academic psychology to its core. Uh, it takes time for the old guard to die. Uh, the famous physicist Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time, okay? So I, I recognized as a young man at 30 in academia that I knew that, that what my thinking was light years ahead of the field. And I knew that the field would proceed, you know, like with a big engine called the truth, driving it forward and everybody in it had their foot on the brake as hard as they could put it. Okay. And it's inched its way forward to the point where now in the world, you see leaking out around the sides are, are uh, evidence of evolutionary psychology and behavior genetics, the two major advances in the field of human self-understanding. But they are fought tooth and nail. And, uh, and so it's better now. I can say things now that when I said them 15 years ago, people would, would look at me in horror, okay, uh, that I would say things. But even now, you know, if I was to talk to a typically educated psychologist, they would be shaking their head like this. They'd start shaking their head after three minutes of me starting to talk, and they'd shake it, and they'd shake it, and they'd shake it, and they'd shake it, and they'd be upset for the next 47 minutes that I was talking to them. Okay, uh, because what I say is revolutionary. Now, because it's, revolu it's revolutionary, because, well, it's true. So human beings did evolve in Africa on, uh, they evolved through solving the problems of Stone Age environments in Africa. That's what your brain is built for. It's built to eat the food there. And uh, if it turns out that you place it in an environment that it wasn't designed, uh, notice how much learning you can do about how bad the current food supply is and what you should be eating, but you still can't do it, okay? Modern learning theory has no ability to integrate that information. They cannot understand it. Okay? You have to understand that the human being is built on instincts for Africa, for an environment of scarcity. If you understand that that's the design of the machine, then you can understand the pleasure drive, okay? Then you, then you still have a very hard problem, but at least you understand the problem. Now, so the same thing is true in, in, in the other side of psychology, which is not the general motivational theory, which is unbelievably important to understand, but also the theory of individual differences, i.e., even though we're all, we all have shared the same motivational design, we are each individually different, as we talked about Jen and me, and a bottle of beer or a glass of wine in front of us, okay? There are individual differences. Will if I drink a beer or a glass of wine, will I have the dopamine go off? Yep, but it won't go off nearly as hot as it will go off in Jim's head. Individual differences. Okay. Alan wants to work in 64 degrees. I want to work in you know, 78 degrees in my office. Way different. I have to turn the air conditioning on for clients because so they're comfortable. I'm not so comfortable at 72. I'd like it a little warmer. Okay. I.e., individual biological differences. Those individual differences, it turns out, are genetic in personality. So that is so politically incorrect. Nobody wants to face that. Nobody can understand it. Nobody wants to see it. Everybody thinks they have contradictory evidence. Everybody's going to say, then there's tremendous disincentives, just as there's disincentives around facing the truth in academic psychology, you know, 30 years ago, when evolutionary psychology was born, coming out of Harvard by John Tooby and Lita Cosmides. The uh, 30 years later, I have talked to those people and I sat down with them at dinner and those two brilliant geniuses that married each other, those two people are frustrated. They feel like they failed. 
And let me tell you something, they did not fail. What they understood and what they developed in terms of human understanding is staggering. They remind me of conversations I had with John McDougall and Colin Campbell, who also feel like they have failed. It's like, you have not failed. Look what you've accomplished. Okay. Uh, but they feel like, no, the whole world doesn't know. I didn't get the whole village to understand what we understand. It's so important. It's exactly how John Tubing and Lady Cosmides feel. We didn't do it. We thought we were going to take over academia and create a revolution in the fields of social science because there should be a revolution. Okay. But they didn't accomplish it. But just as Colin and John have made a significant inroad and they have they have essentially chiseled into the, into the granite defense of the truth that is taking place in medical schools, pharmaceutical industry, you know, the, the widespread industry in general, the food industry. We have chiseled our way in there. Go into the grocery store right now and you're going to see oat milk, soy milk, almond milk. It's like, wow, there's a lot of stuff being sold because there's a lot of people there that know that dairy is not such a good idea for them and the kids. So have, have these guys made an impact? Yes, they have. Has it been what they wanted? No, they're frustrated, okay? Similarly, I'm not, I'm not the big theoretical genius that these people are. I, I'm more practical, okay? And so I, I took the, uh, what these people had been figuring out and I realized, okay, well, if that's not how human psychology works, I know it works this way. This is how we're gonna approach things clinically. Okay. And so I've done that for 30 years and the, uh, it turns out, oh, there is systematic ways that you can approach clinical problems that are more effective than, than, than you're going to do it. If you just approach it with your most, it's going to be much better on average than if you use your just general good intelligence and social skill out of a good therapist, they're not going to be as good in the same way that somebody who has pretty good intuition that, you know what, maybe you ought to eat less potato chips and Maybe you ought to eat a little bit more natural food and, you know, put olive oil on your salmon, you know, bake it in olive oil rather than, and then fry it and stuff. It's like somebody using their intuition, a therapist, counselor, healer, using their intuition about what you ought to eat would be better than, than what the person was doing before. But not as good as if you listen to John and Colin. Okay. That's what this is like. And so I forget what the question was, but it's, it's not that, that therapy's bad or wrong or anything. It's really what's how good is the intuition of the therapist? And people go, uh, they go because it's the best that they, they need help. So you go to the person that seems like is the officially recognized wise man or wise woman. And that person is comfortable talking to you and they'll they'll talk to you with some confidence because by God, that's what they do for a living and they've never heard anything better. And so they're doing the best they can. They're like your, your nutritionist, your, your RD at the local hospital that they sent you to because you got to type two diabetes and you're 80 pounds overweight. That RD does what she can. Okay. She tells you what she's supposed to tell you. She's told what she's taught. She does it, you know, hey, she's doing the best. She's probably sending you in a direction that's better than the direction that you've been in, but it's not nearly what it could be, okay? So that, that's how we look at that. I would also argue that there are perverse incentives in, in that, uh, uh, that, are, that sit inside the system. And that's a phrase that I picked up from none other than Dr. Jen Hawk. So Jen Hawk is someone who understood in her doctoral thesis that there are perverse incentives for people doing self-destructive things, you know, in economic political systems in, in the indigenous peoples in Alaska. And so that the principles that she identified are, are uh, Colin would screen, yeah, there's perverse incentives all over the food industry. So would John, okay? And Robert Whitaker would say, oh, there's perverse incentives all over the pharmaceutical industry for psycho psychotropic medications. The, 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 the therapists, the psychiatrists who are, who are signing the, the scripts and, and seeing the big, they have perverse incentives for believing that it's helping. Okay, so they, they might be perfectly consciously honest, but they, 
they're not too eager to look at alternative evidence that may be contradicting their position. Therapists that are believing in trauma theory, that the reason why the person is hyper anxious, that the reason that they struggle, that they have panic, that they have this, or they have uncomfortable social situations, that those people may label and be able, well, if they ask, they're gonna find out that they've had some traumatic experiences in their life, as everybody has. And then they're going to circle around and talk about that and they're going to wander all around the field and they're never going to find, you know what I mean, where the gold is. They're not going to find it because that's not where the problem is. But they've been taught that that's where the problem is. Not unreasonable, just like psychiatric medication and its logic is not unreasonable. Okay. Um, just like paleo is not unreasonable. But there are errors of, that sit inside of it of great significance. And it turns out that if you get, and so a lot of therapy is useless as a, because the people well-meaning have perverse incentives for not listening to a revolution of the field that is saying, no, actually what you've been doing is useless. And uh, this is actually how you need to look at it. These are the facts. No, no, I don't think so. That's not what my professor said. That's not what I think. That's not what I'm comfortable with. Yeah, you're a bypass surgeon that doesn't want to hear Dean Ornish's research, okay? It is an embarrassment about human nature, perverse incentives, and just, you know, people and the difficulties of perverse incentives in general that Dean Ornish published in, I think, 1992. And 30 years later, we finally now have some hospital in New York that's going all plant-based, you know, uh, in the hospital, it's like, okay, you got, you can't imagine being Dean with his paper in the Lancet of what it took to get there and saying, here it is. I finally arrived at the top of the mountain. I have now shoved this in your face. And, and if you're called Will Usselstyn, you're even fancier because you're the big shot doc at the Cleveland Clinic. You're the number one surgeon there. Okay. You're like, here it is, everybody. We need to change. And all of them just basically give them the finger and tell them to shut up and pat them on the head and say, yeah, you're goofy. <laughs> I couldn't have done it. <laughs> okay. I would have yelled and made a complete ass out of myself. I'm close enough now. <laughs> Got a little too much John McDougall in me. You know, McDougal couldn't work in a system like that. He, he didn't have the temperament the way Caldwell Esselstyn did. Esselstyn could work in that system and be calm and reasonable. John couldn't do it. Colin could. Colin's got a calmness and he's going to be careful. John couldn't do it. John's too much of a warrior. He screamed bloody murder and said, you guys are a bunch of, you know, whatever. <laughs> they don't like him. <laughs> Nobody wanted to listen to him. I understand the whole thing. Anyway, as a psychotherapist and a uh, uh, psychologist that, that feels incredibly blessed in the way that McDougall felt blessed reading the people that pointed him the right direction. I got pointed the right direction uh, by great innovators and it made my life as a counselor much more rewarding because I was able to help. I'm limited by my personality. I don't do everything right. Sometimes I irritate people. And then what, what a better therapist, uh, a better natural therapist like a Jen Hawk you know what I mean? Could have guided those people forward. Now I have sat. I I never said uh, that that uh, I'm not limited by my personality. We all are, but I I was also found this direction and found the truth of human change and what it takes to help people change and what we can do. I found the truth by listening carefully, you know, and recognizing and have the courage to to see something that was uncomfortable. Okay. John told Mary, okay, we got to get rid of the meat. And then a few months later, he said, uh-oh, we got to get rid of the dairy. You know, it's like, uh, you know, lesson by lesson, he learned his way. And then what has he done? He saved a lot of us. Okay. And so that's what, uh, that, that, that's what I'm trying to do from here is just try to promote a better understanding. And sometimes if people get me upset, sometimes it steps on some perverse incentives that people have. They, they think that, trauma-based thinking and, and it's unfriendly to discount that and that you're being mean and oh no you're wrong and there's so many people disagree with you and no people can change and you know 
you know, so and so. No, your I saw my cousin change his personality. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. His circumstances changed. His behavior changed, but his personality did not change. Okay, and so one of the great lessons that we have derived uh, in in the thirty years of my you know, 40 years now of my education, but 30 years is where, you know, I got a classic education for 10 years. And then after that, after it was done, I found the truth about personality and psychology. It was literally when I was just finishing my PhD is when the truth became evident. And um, with that, I find the most important thing, which is uh, that we constantly talk about here and circle around here. You can't change who you are, but you can change your environment. And that is the only thing that you can change. So therefore, your job is to work harder on your environment than you do on yourself. Okay? You will feel the impact in your life. Your life can change, but you can't. Okay? Your life experience can change dramatically, but you can't. So therefore, your job needs to be directed at figuring out how to make your life experience as good as it can possibly be made. That means focusing on your physical ecology, i.e. the food around you and the space around you, and most importantly, your social ecology, okay? Figuring out who's in your life and, and in what ways. And so positioning those two, you know, essentially working your environment to your very, very best opportunity advantage that is the secret of life. Okay. That's it. That's good. That is the secret of life. We must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. Truer words were never spoken, regardless of the fact that nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> I'm so happy, AJ, that you get me and you understand, you know, what I, you also understand when I get ornery. I've been ornery with you at times, you know, and we, we battle over some of these very major illusions. The illusions can be huge. You know, we can really feel like, quote, we can change ourselves. It's like, well, you can learn and grow, but that isn't changing your personality. That's just altering your understanding of your, uh, of your environmental situation. That, that's important change. That's critical. That's growth. But we have to respect and honor the fact that our personalities are us. Okay. That, that's those, those things we need to work with that. It's like, you know, understand, you know, we're a tool, we're, we are a pair of pliers and a wrench, we're not a hammer. If, you know, gold hammer's a hammer. If you're not gold hammer, you're not gold hammer. Don't try to be him. So our, yeah, that's what we want to do here is work harder on our environments than we do on ourselves. And when we do that, you know, good things tend to happen. It's funny, his name is gold hammer, you know. <laughs> Those people have been like that for a long time. That is so funny. Well, this was so enjoyable. Like I didn't plan that you were going to be on my 1200th episode, but boy, what a treat. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. Fantastic. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Sherry Alberts from The Watering Mouth. Take care.